Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Empowering Musicians podcast. I am your host, Michael Manley, and I've been doing a series of uh, highlights of really uh, currently working musicians, uh, especially freelance musicians, to really dig into how they're building their careers and how they're succeeding. And I'm very happy to welcome this week Bill Leary, who is my first in-person guest. Woo, hey. So uh, <laughs> the first time I've ever had somebody on the same camera with me. So it's very exciting. We're not in our own Zoom boxes. And um, Bill, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what your career has been like? Um, okay, I'm a saxophonist, woodwind player, doubler. And uh, after college, started touring with Ringling Brothers Circus, which kind of led to almost everything I've done. Yeah, uh, indirectly or directly, and um, toured with Ringling Brothers for about five years, on and off, and a few Broadway shows in the mix. Went to Singapore for a show, and then ended up in Vegas and been here the last eight years. Great, um, and just wrapped up my third show out here. So awesome. Yeah. Well, when you mentioned doubling, what does that actually mean, like to somebody who doesn't maybe know that term? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so when I ended up transferring to New Jersey City University, all of my professors there were on Broadway playing shows, Fosse to Thoroughly Modern Millie, and I had no idea, really. I just know oh, I play a little flute, play a little clarinet, and they explained to me, no, if you can really up your game in those areas as a doubler, it'll open up this whole world of shows, and I had no clue about that um, till I went to New Jersey to study with those guys. Yeah, and doubling is really more like tripling or quadrupling. Right. Yeah. And it's yeah. a term that we use in the industry because when you when you're working um, on Broadway or in a show and you're getting you're playing two instruments, you're getting what's called a double, which is a, a pay bump. Yeah. So, um, and if you're playing three of those instruments, you're getting two doubles, mm -hmm. which is an oxymoronic sounding phrase. Right. <laughs> right. But uh, that's how we do it. Um, mm -hmm. So, tell me a little bit about. Um, you, you, were you were you starting out as a clarinet player or were you a sax player? A uh, sax player. I mean, I played clarinet in fifth grade and hated it. And I was like, I want to play sax. Yeah. So yeah, I started out as sax and then picked up a flute in high school. And then, um, yeah. And then when I, I went to Indiana University and eventually transferred to New Jersey City University. And that's where I picked up clarinet and then started really, really getting into the, to the doubling heavy because it just... I didn't realize all these doors would help open if I could do that. Yeah, yeah it's, I mean, there are certain people that have success um, as straight ahead sax players, mm -hmm. but it's it's not as, as common, right? And right. Like if you play sax, yeah. flute, clarinet, bass clarinet. Or yeah, whatever. and it was fun. I enjoyed playing all the instruments and getting called to do crazy gigs and yeah. And tell me a little bit about the circus. And uh, I started for you. I mean, I got called from a recommendation from somebody when I was at Indiana, and I had no clue. I was I was working on my master's at the time in New Jersey, and they flew me down to Nashville. And I remember saying, "So, uh, where, what hotel are we staying in?" They're like, "Hotel." The so they literally dropped me at the train, gave me the music and a CD player at the time and said, all right, good luck. See you tomorrow. And then that was it. The book was like this big. Yeah. And just trying to go through it, sift through it all in one night. And uh, yeah, it went well. And so it led to many years of working with them. And uh, I had a blast. Yeah. Yeah. And and how long were you with the circus? Uh, I don't know, five years. I did yeah. a two-year run to start. And then I was kind of always called to fill in. Usually if somebody got fired. <laughs> yeah. So can you come down to Florida tomorrow? I'm like, okay. And then, um, yeah, I just made lifelong friends out there and uh, just had a great experience. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, when I was the director of touring and theater, I had worked with you and your colleagues on your contract negotiations. Mm -hmm. And um, this the, the Ringling Circuses were unionized, which mm -hmm. was great. Yeah. And it was, in a way, like a really interesting um workplace because it was largely unchanged for about 180 years it mm -hmm. was like it was like i was sad when it closed but i was also like amazed that it lasted as long as it yeah did. 
And when you say the train, like everybody lived on the train. Yeah. Like that's how people were getting around. Um, and uh, I remember taking a tour. I have such great circus stories, but I remember taking a tour with Don Parker at the yep. time and um, looking at this, like, I don't know, maybe seven by nine space. Yeah, I remember when you came. I do remember you visiting the train, I think in Long Island or somewhere. Yeah. And because in our contract, it said the band members were given a stateroom, but it never said, and Don was really great at trying to get that uh, wording in there. What constituted a stateroom yeah and you were yeah you came and checked it out so that way they could have put us in a tiny little clown room because actually the clowns had small rooms <laughs> well that was that was my favorite quote of yeah. Don's was you know i was looking at this you know this where the musicians were living and it was yeah. just like you know it was like literally like seven feet by nine feet or something right and i was like wow how do you you know you guys really live in this tiny space and he said oh you should see where the clowns live. That was, yeah, even way smaller than like the closet. And I was like, oh, the clowns. No. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so uh, I never did see where, well, I don't even know if I saw where the clowns live, but it was basically like a phone booth, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it even had like a little slat door like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And we our rooms were big compared to most out there. Yeah. And um, no, I remember seeing you guys walk around the train here. That was like an 04 or something. or five. I forget. It was a while ago. Yeah. So, yeah. It was yeah. a while ago. And for those of you watching, I do have some of my circus swag here. We've got our, our ringling clown and our ringling elephant. Um, <laughs> and it was such a, uh, a, 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 it was a very sad year when, when they announced they were, yeah. they were closing. And, um, you know, it was, <clears throat> they never did successfully really um, message about the elephants and all the other animal acts that, that was the kind of lightning rod that um, got them into some, you know, political hot water, but, um, yeah. but at the same time, you know, I just remember thinking this is like the only way that certain people are going to see elephants or yeah. see tigers because they don't live near zoos. Right. And so there's a, a huge like education and animal um, appreciation mm -hmm. value that's lost because we yeah. don't have the circus. Um, yeah. So, uh, but that was a, a great um, experience. And um, from there, did you, is that when you moved to Las Vegas? Um, kind of, I, I did, a I did a tour of Annie in 08 and nine, and then I ended up going to Singapore, but that, um, with kind of a Cirque du Soleil copy show. And that was directed by Phil McKinley, who had directed many ringling shows and their gold unit a lot, their one ring show. Yeah. And, um, and then when I, after that, my stint over there, I went back to Ringling for a little bit and then came to Vegas from a Ringling connection. Uh, my friend Peter Bifano kind of recommended me for this gig and Vegas Nocturne. And when that gig was going on, Phil McKinley came to the show, told me about Showstoppers. And I, so it's like that one show kind of, you know, leapfrogged into all these other things. So. Yeah, and yeah. that's I think often <clears throat> how it works. You get yeah. you get on a gig, and then you meet people, and you make some connections. Yeah, and um, you know uh, we had John Miller on a, a, well, about two weeks ago. Yeah, a big contractor in New York, and he basically mm -hmm. said, you know, you get on the radar by showing up. You know, yeah, um, makes a lot and, of sense. And putting it out there, and, and he he had an interesting story about hiring somebody who was really young, who he didn't know, but um, and needed a sub at the last minute. But he had played with so many people. Um, and he had, he had been endorsed by so many people that he was like, I'm going to give this kid a chance. And right. Ended up being one of his top players for years. That's um, great. Yeah. So yeah, it is really about your network and about, um, you know, showing up and I think playing well and also being somebody who isn't crazy. Yeah. I mean, that was a big thing on Ringling because we, well, like I played a gig last night with, um, father John Misty and they're mm -hmm. on the road. Mm -hmm. And I was just a you know uh, an add on here in Vegas, and they're like, oh yeah, we're on the road. They're on the road for three weeks, and then they have a break, and then they're on the road. For, we were on the road fifty weeks. Yeah, you know, like so. I'm like, you guys don't know what on the road really means, and so because it was funny how they were saying, uh, yeah, after about twenty days, we start to get on each other's nerves. I'm like, yeah, after about twenty weeks. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was being able to like coexist with each other and such. I mean, we were playing a lot on that show and. So yeah, just being able to get along and all that being easy to work with, which, you know, you're tested out there. So, yeah, I was really amazed at the, 
um, with the circus, especially it just, as you said, the books are really thick. Yeah. It's a lot of, it's like wall to wall playing and it's yeah. just, um, extremely demanding work. Yeah. Um, and then I just remember watching the band leaders who are always trumpet players yep. who would be playing with one hand, blowing yeah. their brains out and conducting, yeah. you know, it was just <laughs> crazy. It's a, a real lost art and, yeah. um, it's a shame, but, uh, and there's so much great music that was written for the circus. Too, mm -hmm. when I think oh yeah. It. Uh, all those um, marches, the KL King marches. Well, and then when I was there, it kind of transferred into um, uh, film score composers. Michael mm. Pickton and Greg, Craig Safin were two guys who had been working in Hollywood. And they still would, you know, sprinkle in some of those traditional things. But it was kind of just a through score. You know, it just yeah. didn't stop. Yeah. So. And um, <clears throat> it really is important when you're on a tour, especially like you all were on a train. Yeah. Um, and, um, I did, when I did early touring, it was with, um, an opera company, which was doing one nighters. Ooh, yeah. So, you know, and, um, the great news is you got to play great music at the end of the night. Yes. But, yeah. um, but you're on a bus all day. And we used to joke that like, instead of having auditions, we would just put people on a bus for five hours. Like that would be the test. That's true. That's really Cause, funny. Because if you can't get along in those kind of close, like yeah. submarine type situations, and yeah. pits, are, pits are like that as well. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. When you're in, whether it's a stage or a pit and you're you're playing with the same, you know, mm -hmm. 15 or 20 people all the, all the time. Yeah. And you really have to learn how to get along with your colleagues. That's the key. Yeah. So um, you just most recently finished up a show called Opium. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that was a lot of fun. And how did that, that was a blast. how was that for you? That's almost like a circus in a way. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's a variety show, comedy, circus acts. And it started with a five piece band and a singer. And at that time I was the assistant music director. So I got a chance to conduct while playing sax. And that was invaluable. Uh, Dave Ostrom was the band leader and working with him and being able to you know, play and try to conduct and cue and do all that was, it was a something as a sax player, we rarely ever get a chance to do. And um, it was great. And, and, it, and I got that under my belt to at least say I could kind of do that now. Yeah. And, um, and then unfortunately, as, as shows goes, we know they made cuts and then I became the one man band mm. singing, rapping, kind of <laughs> having lines on the show. Um, and playing a bunch of instruments, keyboards, and and uh, yeah, and then yeah, my 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 tenure just ended, so yeah, or my run, and they did big changes. It's still going on, but without any live musicians, and yeah, it's it's totally different now. So yeah, yeah, um, and it's a shame because it is a variety show, and you kind of really miss that live music. Yeah, um, and things are very. Um, Especially here in Las Vegas, it's very, uh, it's like a roller coaster, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> some years you might have, you might be employed for four or five years on one gig. Yeah. And then it just might all dry up and there might be an explosion of work. In the next yeah. Year. Yeah. I mean, hoping things turn around here yeah. soon. But uh, I was one of the f lucky few, knock on wood, to have that job. So, um, yeah. And yeah, it, now I'm just uh, back out there and see what happens next, I guess. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you do any teaching? Uh, well? I was doing a ton of private teaching, but the job just, there was a lot of times I'd have to go in early, so I kind of scaled back. So I'm going to probably amp that up a little bit now. Yeah. So, yeah. And do you teach all the woodwinds? or just I do. Oh, nice. I mean, I'll do flute and clarinet, a little bit of oboe, but for that, I used to always tell everybody to go to Caitlin Kramer, but she's not in town anymore, so. Yeah. And she was my teacher. She helped me a ton. So uh, um, I, there are some new people, but maybe you know them better than me in the oboe world. But uh, yeah, especially beginner. If they get really, really high level of flute clarinet, I would pass them off to like, you know, somebody at UNLV or yeah. one of the specialists in just that. But um, a lot of my sax students, I would, I would be like, you know, time to get a flute, time to get a clarinet. If you want to do that, even the best players and... Uh, yeah, I was at LVA for four or five years as a para pro and taught a lot of kids from there. And that was a blast. So maybe do a little more of that again. 
Yeah, um, and that's our arts high school, Las Vegas. Academy. Oh yeah, I'm saying it like everybody yeah. knows. And I've done <laughs> some parapro work there as well. It's extremely rewarding. Um, it is, and yeah. I think you, I, I really um, have learned a lot working with beginners and intermediate players because you really have to break down what you're doing. Oh yeah, and you have to figure out like, well, what is the most efficient way to learn and to play? Yeah. Um, so that's a really good way to just remind yourself. Now, how many instruments do you play totally? Uh, I mean, I would just, it was funny not to keep talking about last night, but there were guys were doubling in all weird ways. Like I said, there was a guy playing trumpet, flute, sax, vibes. Another keyboard player was playing trumpet. And I'm like, I just stick to the woodwinds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, flute, clarinet, saxes, and oboe. English horn, so that's my wheelhouse. Yeah, I could, I could comp some chords, but yeah, I'm not gonna. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, I'll leave the piano to somebody else. Yeah. Great. Um, so, what's next for you? You're just out there freelancing now. Yeah, I'm just doing a little freelancing since the show just ended less than a week ago. I'm gonna go back to upstate New York for a couple of weeks and just relax and uh, see the family. That's where I'm from. Oh, great. And then I'll be back and just uh, you know start hitting the pavement, as they say, and. I'm open open for anything. Just maybe start slowly building up the teaching studio again and do some more freelance stuff. I've upped my home studio because I have a couple of friends in LA who sometimes will call me, Can you can you record this for me like tonight? Oh, and wow. I'm like, uh I get done with the show and I wasn't happy with what I had, so I've upped my home studio. So um yeah, we'll see where it goes. Been through this so many times, so I'm just letting it you know, take his course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is something that is becoming more common um, and was kind of exacerbated by COVID. Yeah. Which was the idea that um, with technology the way it is, if you needed to record a jingle or mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. and let's say you had a combo of five people, mm -hmm. um, ideally you'd all be in the room, right? Right. But right. now you can all record your own separate parts right. on a home studio and it can all be mixed. Yeah. Um, and that's a big change. And in, 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 I don't know, is that a different skill? How do you do that? Oh, man. Yeah, it is. It's it's kind of like learning a, a, another instrument in a way, like just getting used to technology and be able, being able to, you know, do that quickly. Um, I just use a, a program called Logic and my back book and... Um, just it's always like ready to go mm -hmm. and um yeah i've done a few where i've had to play multiple instruments and so like or if i had to play two alto parts i might switch the mouthpiece up or do something so it doesn't sound so homogenous because to sound more like a section yeah because everybody sounds a little different and uh mm -hmm. yeah i've done that a little bit and, and one friend he kind of will add me just on top of things because he's like pitching demos kind of uh, for film score stuff. And he's like, I just need a sax on this or a flute. And um, luckily where I live, I can just do that at night. And uh, um, yeah, that got going a lot a lot more during COVID. So, yeah. Yeah. And so um, with your last gig, you did have to do some acting, right, as well? Yeah, I had speaking parts. And it was ridiculous. And I was nervous <laughs> as all get out when it started. Yeah. But it, 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 I got used to it a little bit. So if there's any acting musician roles out there. No. Um, yeah, it, it just it came another skill that, I mean, I probably did a thousand times now. Wow. It was not a thousand, at least almost. So yeah. where I had a, and in this version of the show that just ended, I had a lot more little roles, little, little spots. Yeah. Um, and the director we had just, uh, Allegra Libertoni, she was great at getting that out of me. Like, yeah, I had no faith in myself. And she said, you could do this. And it went okay. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's it's not typical acting because there's a lot of interaction with the audience. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot of, um, it's almost entirely that with the other actors, right? Right. It's like a Don Rickles type show where it's all about interacting. Yes. Uh, and yes. improvising. Yes. With the audience. Yep. So that must have been a challenge. Having it it was. Yeah. And some nights people would yell stuff and I'm trying to say my lines and just being around really great comedians all the time. I would just kind of try to follow what they did. Yeah. You know, and just take your time with the line. That was it. Just take your time. And um, a lot of times an act would end and I would just have to 
give enough time for them to reset the stage or whatever. And so like, if I burn through the lines, they might not be ready. Okay. So they're always like, just take your time, milk it, milk it. So oh, interesting. Yeah. So I had to really stretch my little parts. Yeah. So, and um, you know, this idea of actor musicians is, is becoming yeah really its own subgenre. I mean, yeah, we have shows like, um, the, the first really big one was Cabaret. Yes. The restaging yep. of Cabaret mm -hmm. um, with like the actors being the band. Yeah. And then we've got Hades Town. We've got musicians that are actor musicians. Yep. We have this happening more and more. Yeah. Um, um, bandstand that was written by the guys from here. Yeah. Um, same thing. Yeah. So I'm open to it now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not, I wouldn't say my acting is near my musical ability, but um, I at least know I can delve in, you know, I've, a little bit more comfortable yeah. doing that. So. And you can put it on the resume. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. For sure. So um, are you still studying new instruments or where, where are you with um, your, uh, your career? No, just still, you know, <laughs> studying reed making for oboe. And right now I'm still just, the one instrument I'm really studying is oboe still. It can always work on reed making and all that. Um, you know, it's been nice living here in Vegas and being on some long running shows to be able to like, for a while they were studying with Brandon Fields and working on saxophone still. And then, um, oh my God, my my uh, Marina Stern worked oh, yeah. some clarinet lessons with her because I was on Showstoppers at the Wind that had some pretty heavy clarinet. And I was always, I was read two, but I'd jump over and play read one and had some pretty uh, gnarly clarinet parts that pushed my game, pushed my, push me to my limits. And so kind of like whatever gig I'm on, I might take something that'll help me with that. Yeah. And oboe has always been a passion. Um, and I play in the CSN college of Southern Nevada orchestra every Monday. It's kind of a community group, but it gets me, gets the oboe in my face, which there's not a lot of opportunities for someone like me to do as a doubler, you know? Yeah. Cause I'm not getting called for the solo straight oboe gigs, but doubling yeah and that just keeps it it's really helped so much yeah. to be able to do that so i would say that's what i still work on the most yeah know? i mean you could probably spend your lifetime learning how to make an oboe read yes <laughs> i mean it's, yep. it's you you yep. know and when you're starting out learning instruments and people are like oh i love the oboe mm -hmm. and you're like well you understand that like you're going to spend half your life shaving cane Yes. <laughs> and uh, you're going to be surrounded by piles of yeah. cane shavings, much like a hamster in a cage. That's right. And yeah. You're just going to spend your life doing yeah, that. Yeah. It's already at the end of the night. I would, after shows, sometimes I'll go home and play and work on them and, you know, get a little taste of bourbon or something and scrape the reeds. And, yeah. You know. It's like, okay. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. And I, I always remember flying with oboists, you know, because like they always have like shaving. Uh, like scrapers and yep. they have knives and it's like, yeah. how do you get that through TSA? But yeah. Yeah. You have to check that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When I was at New Jersey city university, uh, the head of the woodwind department Ed Jaffe, um, I was taking just a woodwind methods class and uh, with Dan Willis, who's an amazing woodwind doubler in New York and sax player, one of my idols. Uh, he or Ed Jaffe said, Larry, you're going to play oboe. I heard you have an affinity for it. I'm like, yeah, I like it. So I didn't think it would, you know, I'd still be doing it 20 years later. Yeah. And, and it always hasn't been on gigs, but I actually did play it on opium for like about two months. Oh, wow. Um, there was an, an, a backup act where I was able to work in oboe. Really? Yep. Yep. So, so what, what, what would the oboe, what would the oboe track it would, be for that? It was, uh, I was, I think it was kind of like a pretty moment. And then, um, gosh, I got to um yeah it was just more i played oboe to kind of set the mood kind of like a more tranquil thing and then picked up the sax yeah but um yeah we worked it in the show that's in, great in, uh, yeah so versatility is really important in in the woodwind players life. oh yeah without a doubt yeah. yeah yeah um like i said back to ed jaffe he has a woodwind series where he's been interviewing great woodwind artists all the time if you just watch any of his things uh on YouTube, they're they're great and uh, really insightful for all that stuff. And just how, especially in New York as a working player, I'm mean, not in New York, but um, to get out in the touring world and to get in the show world, it really helps. 
even yeah. though the first gig I had was just alto sax, which is ringling. Yeah, I was still I still had my flute and clarinet out there, and it's like I you know didn't want it to get rust on those things because it's so important. Yeah, absolutely. And um, being kind of a lifelong learner, I think, is also important. Totally, 1,000%. Doesn't stop. Yeah, it never does stop. Um, and we've had a couple of oboists on the show, and they, it's been great. Um, and uh, it's definitely a passion. You know, you definitely have to love yeah. it. Um, yeah. It's nice for me to put on that hat to kind of go and play classical music when I play with the community college orchestra, because so much of the time I'm not, you know, playing crazy shows or yeah. jazz or rock or last night with father John Misty, very indie and trippy. And yeah, it's just, I, I like doing it all. And I think that's why woodwinds appealed to me. Yeah. I love playing jazz, but I also like, like playing classical. And I, I had a great classical sax teacher growing up and not that I, not that there's a ton of gigs for classical sax, but that mindset, I still love, I love getting into it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. And um, yeah, there's not a lot. There's some soloists. There's some sax quartets that do pretty well. Yeah. Um, but that's again a very a, yeah a very, very small, small niche. niche. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you are one of the people that apparently watches the podcast, which I'm very I do. About. <laughs> yeah. So I watch it or I listen to it as I'm like you know doing things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. great. Is there anything that you found valuable so far, or is it the, the biggest time? thing that, and I've I've explained it to people, <laughs> is your formula for taking a gig? Yeah, and I've and people are like, wait, what? One through like I try to explain to them, but I said just kind of break it down how yeah. you did, and it made so much sense. And yeah, even like the gig I did last night, where it was kind of a high profile person. I'm kind of a fan of his band. You know, like that was on the high for always wanting to do it, like a three. Yeah. Um, the pay was probably a two. And then I looked, oh, yeah, they were playing a big venue that sold out probably 3,000 people. So, you know, you know, like they're making money. So I just look at it like that now. Like yeah. somebody called me to do a, um, uh, a charity, obviously for Ukraine, and I'm definitely down to support it. But I just asked, well, okay, what do you what do you need? What are you interested in? Like, okay, so is everybody giving their time? Is everybody donating their products? I just need to know that, and they well, we'll get back to you. So I think that's a no. So yeah, but I'm like, I will do it. But like, they want to just exploit the musicians, but the bartender's not bringing in their boot. You know, like right. like you said, I said I want to think about that now. If it is a true charity, I will t gladly donate some time. But I think it might not have been you know that's you made me think about that in a more um analytical way where sometimes well i'm not doing anything that night and i want to play right but kind of but bringing a critical eye to it. a very critical eye and it's and when i've explained it to other musicians they're like that scale is great you know your little formula or, or <laughs> something close to that they're like yeah so. yeah i need to um just put it um I need to create a widget out of it and then yeah. it or something <laughs> yeah. like Ron Popeil. Exactly. With the pocket fisherman. Because it really is my pocket fisherman. Okay. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. Um, and that episode is called, I can't remember the title of it, but um, I, I called my formula the Gigomatic. Gigomatic. Yep. And you can uh, look for that in past episodes if you haven't seen it yet. Right. Um, and that's, uh, I think, a really important thing is to, like, again, say, I, I got called for a gig. It happens, you know, yeah. maybe twice a year. Right. Um, but I, I love playing and I'm still, uh, you know, keeping my chops up. Yeah. And, um, you know, I kind of went through the same thing where I'm like, well, this sounds like a great gig, um, but I have to just make sure that um, it's it's respecting the musicians. Right. Right. Yeah. And so um, it involved a, a broadcast. And so I was okay. like, OK, well, this is a. This is something I really need to dig into because right. um, when we're when we're uh, captured, either audio or audio visually, and mm -hmm. it's going to go on TV or it's going to go on streaming or whatever, right. we need to make sure that we're taken care of and we're we're treated with respect. And so I had to do some digging to find out. Oh, okay, this is like a union job. So right. um, I was happy to do it, and it's been a real joy um, to to play. And so. Um, but you know, we we often don't go through that math in our head. Yeah. And um, I remember, 
my the example I use of this is a a drummer who worked with Michael Jackson for his whole career. Okay. And um, often uh, folks will be paid a lot of money to tour with people like Father John Misty. Yeah. Right. Yeah. His core band, and they'll they'll be like, "Wow, this is really good bread." Mm -hmm. And there's there's no union contract. In place. Right. Right. And so the problem with that is that if if there is a capture you're not guaranteed any any residual income from that right so um this was years ago and it was right after um michael jackson had passed away um and there was a film called this is that this is it this is it yep and Seen it. hugely yep. popular film and just acres and acres of footage from his tours yeah and so a musician called me up and was like hey i'm I'm the drummer for Michael Jackson and I'm all over this movie and the band is all over this movie. And when are we going to get our bread? Right. Right. And so I did some digging and found out that there was no touring contract. Um, and again, probably upfront money was great for these right. guys. Right. Um, but if you're not, unfortunately, the only, the only protection you have in that case is a union contract. Usually. Right. Um, and because if it's not a union job, um, what you're probably going to sign is a release saying that you are agreeing that any media that's captured for you will be used without any further compensation, right? right. There's going to be that rider in your, in your personal service contract. So, um, you know, I had to tell this guy, I'm, I'm really sorry, but, um, unless the family wants to give you some bread, like there's not much I can do for you. Right. There was no, there's no contract to enforce right. for this work. So. Um, that's just something that I think should be part of every musician's education is just like knowing, um, you know, okay, if this is a, if this is a, a job, that's a freelance job that is not covered, or if it's covered, these are my risks. Mm -hmm. Um, do I want to lend my work and my talent to this, knowing that I could be exploited, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so just having that, that kind of conversation in your head, I think is really empowering. Um, and, and a lot of times it's not taught right. in college. Right. Um, so in our last few minutes, do you have any advice you would give to up and coming musicians who might be graduating um, sax players or wind players? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I mean, for me, it was just, I was taking anything where I could, at that time, you know, playing in local, high school musicals, everything. I did a non-union tour to get my feet wet in the doubling area. Just what I had to do at the time. Cause it's hard to get up there until you have the experience and skills. Um, yeah. And, and to, you know, to educate yourself on all this stuff that we talk about or you talk about, cause it protects both sides. That's what I felt like with Ringling, the contract protected us and them, you know, like they were getting a service, we were supplying it. Yeah. And the gig I was just on was non-union, but I tried to make it that way, but they, I, I felt Speaker World did treat me fairly and compensation was fair. The gig was, I mean, more than fair. They were generous in many ways. So I kept that in check. You know, I remember when I got the gig, I called the union and said like, what do you think of these numbers? What do you think of this? And they were like, yeah. So, um, yeah, not to be afraid as you're coming up, if you have questions, just to call your local union. Uh, if you have questions about gigs or what it should pay or what I should be compensated, because we are so hungry to play when we're young. Yeah. That it's good to keep it in balance. And that's why I feel like your gigo meter is great. <laughs> Even when you're young, you know, uh, obviously when you're young, just get out there and do as much as you can. But at some point, that kind of transfers, you know, like once you have a career established, you're just kind of, uh, yeah, you don't want to be taken advantage of, but also, um, it's good peace of mind. And like I said, I, I've done union things, the circus, and I've done, uh, color purple with Troika was union, like, and I've done non, but the non, as I've gotten older, I kind of just go in really trying to, um, analyze more of it than I did before. So, yeah. 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 And I think um, we would all prefer that everything is union. 
Um, and, and we're not there yet, right, in terms right. of our density and in terms of having the power to do that. But that's, I think, ultimately where we want to be. But there is a balance between like, you know, you can't not show up, right? Like the, right. the John Miller kind of um, yeah. maxim of you got to be out there. People have to know you. Yes. And so his thing was if the phone rings, yeah, I'm open yes. for it. Yeah. Um, but I think we also have to bring that critical eye of like, well, making sure this is going to be it, exactly really going to benefit you as well yeah um, as someone else yeah like um i think you're you were talking about was it desert winds yeah great establishment kind of nonprofit group and that's something like that i would do but if you have to know what n even know what it is yeah then it's don't be afraid to to ask and um yeah because i've gotten some offers for things i'm like what yeah you know like um and it's not even the playing. It might be like where it is or the time or the length or, yeah. you know, um, I had somebody recently call me to put together. Uh, oh, my God. It's, it's, I'll make this quick. Uh, the band in New York City, they, the Barry Sax player and the drums. And, oh, my God, I forget the name. Zoom something. Zoo. Zoo something. They're great. They're playing the stuff. Oh, yeah. They've gotten big. This uh, sax player who dances and everything okay. he wanted that for a wedding and i'm like well a i don't have a band that does that b yeah. it's really specific and i'm gonna have to spend a lot of time writing it out or working out and then we want to have to memorize it to march around i'm like <laughs> i'm like uh, the number i'm gonna have to give you is astronomical and they, i was like i said maybe you should just try calling them <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. so anyway yeah and that didn't work out but yeah uh, yeah anyways no, it, and you mentioned Desert Winds, and that's a group that I, I yeah. played with, and I hope to play with them again this year. Um, with They're the fantastic. Works out. Yeah. It's a really great group. It's a, truly a community group. Mm -hmm. They've you know, just a tiny, tiny budget, and I would love to see them be a professional organization. Right, right. And so, um, and I think they they have the artistic uh, yeah. chops to do that, but it's about building up the, um, you know, the the resources behind it. Right. Um, so we can truly become a, a professional mm -hmm. group. But, but again, like if somebody said, Hey, there's a free, uh, uh, a free, uh, you know, opportunity to play at MGM arena, I'd be like, no, if right. they're charging tickets or whatever. So you, we just have to be really careful. I think in our own minds and, uh, I'm glad you found my, my gig. Oh myself. yeah. Cause I, I feel like for me playing the community college orchestra and oboe, that's good for me because I'm not going to get that call <laughs> necessarily. Yeah. And it helps me raise that level of my skills. And also it, they're not, you know, the concerts are like practically free. You know, they're not making a big, it's yeah. a community college, they're not making a profit. Yeah. It, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. And I, I mean, the John Miller talk was great. I'm, he came to Jersey city and spoke and I still remember things he said then, Yeah, you know, like how we kind of are, in the service industry and you know kind of i was i just had coffee with a friend of mine who's playing sax with usher a couple days ago and he said you know guys are already starting to complain but he's like we are here for him you know like if he needs to change the show we need to do that you know like yeah we still have to remember like sometimes we get hired we are to help the artist you know like so much of the time we just i don't know you know, they always say, give a musician a gig and that's what like, or what, how do you get a, what is this? It's like, how do you get a musician to complain? Right? Yeah. Give him a gig. So. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I think that's, um, that's a really key thing because, uh, I believe that it's actually in balance, right? So there yeah. are certain players who are really the top players, right? Uh, the top of the field. Um, I think that they also have to be good colleagues. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think that people would rather have the second best player who's a good colleague yes. than the first player who's a crazy diva. Yeah, 1000%. And that's something that people don't realize. And and again, you get on these gigs like you're like, oh, I'm playing with Usher and I'm, I, I you know, whatever. But it's not about you at the end of the day. It's about, it's yeah. about the music. Yeah. And, and I feel like my ringling experience set me up for and you popping out Don Parker was a big influence in the union. Like just making sure it's fair. So, like there's some things Don's like, yeah, we don't, we're not going to go after that. Yeah. And I'm like, why? You know, I was young. Why not? And yeah. It's like, well, no, we, we got to pick our battles and try to 
you know, Ringling was always fair with us and we had a good relationship with the union in Ringling. So yeah, it gave me a good education young on like what to keep an eye on and other gigs where I'm like, well, that's cool because they're doing this. Or like like I said, when I was on a non-union gig, there was many benefits I was getting that I've never gotten on union gigs. You know, mm. like always getting free dinner, you know, like mm. at the show, different things where I'm like, okay, they're doing these things that are positive. If this changes, maybe I'll, you know, pull my inner Don Parker out and go after them. Yeah. Not that Don was like that. Don, yeah. if you're watching, <laughs> yeah. love you, man. Miss you. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, at one time there were. Th this was what blew my mind. There was there was three circuses out. Yeah. And yeah. then within like five years, there's no circuses. No, but just, they're like, they're coming course. back at the end of this year. That's what they say next yeah. year. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I I don't know what that means as far as the music. Yeah. Um, do they have an obligation to honor our contract or not that we had in place that's a really good legal question but, yeah um do you know any musicians who have been called about no that? don't know anything yeah um i do know someone from opium who auditioned and sat down and talked to kenneth fell the producer owner and you know he just said they're just trying to create something new uh, reinvent it so yeah and nothing i didn't i've heard anything about musicians but he was he could have cut the band years ago yeah, that's what everybody was always afraid. Of. Oh, we'll cut the band from nine to six, and in, in the big shows, they were they had a six piece band in the one ring show. Yeah, uh, the gold show, but they were playing much smaller venues, and that was a whole different thing. But yeah. I I would hope there'd be something because I feel like Kenneth Feld really did enjoy having that live band element, especially for the circus. Yeah, <laughs> you know? and there's um there's a lot of reasons why you want a live band. Yeah, um, and I think um what people don't understand is why music was integrated so deeply into the circus. A yeah. lot of it has to do with timing. Yes. So um, the horse act is supposed to start and the horse is back there, you know, <laughs> yeah. doing his business yeah. or whatever. And there's all of a sudden 45 seconds that you've got to fill. Yeah. It's hard to do that with a recording. Yeah. I mean, there's all this technology now today with Ableton and looping and tracks that is pretty amazing. Yeah. But there was still that live element, I think, that gave it the energy that the show really yeah. thrived on. And I really hope that they bring it back with a band. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where that lands because they kind of dismantled the entire infrastructure of the circus. Yep. They sold off all the train cars. Yep. Yes, so they, they don't have trains anymore. Right. Um, I guess they could maybe buy Amtrak trains. Yeah, I think um, they'll probably bus and truck this one, you know, yeah, yeah. and make it more because they have all the Disney Live and uh, I, Disney on Ice. So they have a lot of shows still out there, Feld Entertainment. So I think they'll use that infrastructure, that model. And um, without the animals, it'll be a lot easier. Yeah. And uh, that's what they're saying it's going to be. I mean, I think maybe horses. I don't know. I've, I've just heard none of the exotic. So, yeah. Um, or maybe all animalists. I'm not completely sure on that, but I would love to go. You know, hey, if you need anybody, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, I, uh, I never, be fun. yeah, I never understood how the circus made a dime, frankly. Yeah, because there was hundreds of people. Yeah, there's they're on a train. Um, the elephants alone, I think someone told me, cost seventy thousand dollars a year just to feed an elephant and make sure that they. That's were probably about right. And yeah. so I, I never, and so I would, I would go see the circus and. You know, the marketing was a little sketchy, and so the arena would sometimes be half full, and you're like, how are they making any money I think because we, play, we played a lot of shows, even if the arena's half full. I That's mean, true. You did we, tons of shows. At least 10 a week and more. Yeah. You know, every Saturday was three shows. and That's they were amazing. Even if they were half full, this, these are arenas that are 20,000 seats. Right. So they, they, I think they did all right. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Overall, we played a lot of shows, and... Any gig after the circus is a cakewalk, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Broadway, ten, eight shows. The the Vegas standards, 10, 90 minute shows a week. But those are still, you know, do one at eight and 10, and you're out of, you know. Yeah. The circus would be two and a half hours two and playing a half hours, three times. Three times. Yeah. So uh, that's what I'm always the old guy now in the room. You don't know what it was like at the circus. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. The only thing that comes close to that is, um, 
the Christmas spectacular in New York. Totally. Yeah. Um, but that's a very small season, right? It's right. Like maybe two or three and they months. can play what six shows a day. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. I, and, I, and I think are they 90 minutes? They must only be 90 minutes. Yeah. I think, I think there might even be less. Yeah. But they just turn them out in 9 a.m., uh, you know, 1130. Yeah. To, you know, whatever it is. And uh, I remember talking, um, he's passed away, but he was a wonderful, amazing sax player, Woodwind Arts, Jerry Nywood. Mm -hmm. He played it for years and he would say, E pluribus unum, one of many. Like he would play, I think, almost every show. Yeah. That run. And then he said he would sleep for two weeks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Crazy. Um, and yeah. Anyway. Well, um, any other parting words you want to leave our, our, our listeners? Oh, gosh. I don't know. Just, you know, um, yeah. I mean, I think getting involved with the union is great and being just aware and people don't realize. Uh, the resource you have with it. Yeah. You know, from legal to any questions to, I had a friend, something happened a few years ago here where he went and the, uh, something happened on a gig and he went to the union and they, uh, he was paid like almost a year's salary because he was unrightly, unrightfully fired. Yeah. You know, like things like that, just, people forget about the benefits of it. Everybody just thinks, well, what has it done for me or how to get me a gig? I'm like, well, it's not that, but, but it's good to think about it when you're taking jobs. And like I said, it's a great resource to have. Yeah. And, um, we get that. I, I, I do a lot of trainees around that. Yeah. And we talk about that question, like, and I think the, you know, we, we want to encourage people to, first of all, see any, any movement there that they're a part of is that as a movement, yeah right? yeah and so um if you're uh if you're somebody who goes through let's say scouting right um, yeah there there are people that have transformative experiences through through scouting and they identify as scouts their whole life and they give back to the organization and and it's an analogy that makes sense because we want people to have the same identity with their union. Right? Yeah. Like that if you're a member of, of a union that you see the union as yourself and you yes. see it as, um, as, as the source of your, uh, of your power, right. And, yeah. and your, your, your positivity in your career. So, um, getting to that point is, um, it's different in our industry in that we have so much work that is part-time yes or in your case like at opium you were one person right so um a little different than you know trying to organize um uh, a, a auto plant or, or a, a hospital or even a orchestra symphony orchestra or even a symphony orchestra which, all the members which is where we have a lot of density because there's yeah. regular employment there. yeah and um but yeah i think uh moving to that feeling that you know the union is my is me it's not and it's me and you it's right not, it's not another agency is something that I work a lot with yeah. folks on and it's, it's a constant struggle to get, to get there. But, um, and that, that gets people out of the mindset of like, what are you doing for me? Because it's like, well, I'm, I'm the union. Right. right. And well, I remember in New York going to 802 and rehearsing and some places, yeah. you know, like it'd be great if we had something like that here eventually. Uh, but it's, we are the union. It's not someone else, you know, right. Uh, even, you know, I don't know when my show was changing, I'm like we are the show, you know, like we, right. You know, the producer and everything put it out there, but we are it. And, uh, I think that's important. I remember back going back to Ed Jaffe, uh, in school, bringing that up saying, you know, it has all these other things that help us, yeah. you know, and I had a friend going to sub in a show and he wasn't in the union. He's like, you better run down there and join. You can't sub a show, but, yeah. being in the end, but we didn't know we were so young. We just were green and, and um, uh, yeah, briefly, yeah, I went to Indiana and had a little, uh, I hurt my jaw and then took a year off and transferred. And it was the best thing that happened to me because all my teachers in New Jersey were like working players and yeah. they gave me such an education in that, you know, like being cool, showing up on time. You know, when John Miller came, you know, like be, it's a service, you know, like just like just prep me so well. Right. For what I need to know, which I didn't get at Indiana. It was kind of just a lot of, well, a lot of amazing players there, mm -hmm. but I got the real world experience. Um, and Ed was the, the main 
leader in that and just really uh, pounded it home. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, even though I haven't taken a conventional route, yeah. I mean, the other way I would have just stayed in New York and tried to sub and play Broadway, which would have been great. But there was always some adventurous spirit in me. I wanted to tour. I wanted, I mean, I spent two years in Singapore. Like I had a blast in an untypical way, but, um, you know, Ed and Walt Weisskopf, Alan Wan, all these, uh, Dan Willis, these guys just help, you know, they were uh, people I looked up to and just kind of, good great guides and how to do all this stuff and navigate it and yeah and how can i make a living doing this yeah you know so and where were you at iu or where were IU, you yep okay Bloomington, yeah. yeah two years yep okay huge uh, music school great i mean in some of well my friend who plays with usher we met there yeah uh, fantastic but i felt like you know we are in the midwest we were in the midwest and you know some really great pedagogues but the guys in New Jersey City University really knew the career side. Yeah, because you're not going to freelance in Bloomington. No, no. Maybe the four tops come through. Yeah. Once in a while, or the temptations. These guys were doing everything, getting called, going. I mean, we had in our music business class, Ed had people from all over the gamut come in. Contractors, copyists. Uh, John Miller came to our class. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. Yeah, you know, what – you know, guys who are playing on Broadway. And yeah. he would ha bring us to the pits. Um, yeah. Dan Willis let me sit in the pit. And I just, it was great <laughs> just seeing how small it was. Yeah. And then like, yeah, you got to nail your stuff, but also be cool and relaxed. And anyways, it was, yeah. I, it was such an invaluable thing that has just, I still reference all that stuff now. Yeah, so that's great. And I think, um, you know, there is on Broadway, especially when you think about what they've um, had to fight for over yes. the years. I was I was there when the strike happened too, yep. going to school in 2003. Yeah, right? being in big band and my teachers coming in and nobody had jobs for a few weeks. And luckily, and I saw then that this, when the stagehand, right, the, everybody went on strike. Yep. Now, and that's and when actors and the stagehands. Actors and stagehands was yeah. really powerful, which... And the, the management of uh, the, the Broadway producers had kind of uh, a, a tactically kind of a, a, a big misstep in that they kind of cavalierly said to the press, um, you know, in this negotiation, which was really about about preserving live music and theater. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you say to an arranger, um, here's South Pacific, it was originally written for 25 people, make it for three somebody out there's going to do it right and so yeah. um it was really about trying to preserve the integrity through the minimum process which is a you know that says in these broadway theaters you know we're going to hire this many people and um unless there's some special situation which the contract allows people to to right. apply for um and that was what was at stake and the and the, and the producers kind of cavalierly said to the press well you know we could replace everybody with with technology if we had to yeah, um, and and what that allowed um, the musicians to do was to say to the cab driver who may not understand the intricacies of this negotiation, like, do you want to pay one hundred and fifty or two hundred dollars for a Broadway ticket and hear a recording in the yeah. pit, right? And most people understood that issue. They're like, oh no, that's a ripoff, right? Yeah. Um, so when it became like that kind of framing, it was really a, a, a fight that everybody in the, in the public really got behind the musicians on. Yeah, I um, mean, and, and like out here, there's a couple Cirque du Soleil shows that, well, one has no musicians. And wow. to me, I said, it feels like a dance recital. Yeah. You know, put the track on and go, where I refuse to go see this show. And because it, coming from the circus tradition, yeah, it adds so much to the show, the live entertainment, like, I can go listen to the Beatles at home and put on headphones right. and hear it amazingly. Do I need to do that while seeing someone do a flip? You know, like, right. I mean, I get it's a great show and all that, but to me personally, the live element of a band following a performer, following the tricks right. is so, is more valuable to me than, you know, the, I can listen to, the, I can't go see a circus at home. 
and right. see that like I could you know but like I can put on the Beatles and listen right. to amazing you know and hide everything amazing at home and yeah so I guess the show I'm talking about is Beatles love so <laughs> anyways yeah and, but and it's, it's just my personal opinion and I come I I work so much in the circus so yeah and it, again it's about timing you want you yeah want to, to yeah and react. It, and and it's it's a good show but it I always feel like when there's tracks it just becomes a Feels like a dance recital. Just put it on. Like we need that live album, especially Broadway. Cir Cirque du Soleil yeah. has many great shows that have amazing musicians. So yeah. there's just been a couple where they don't. So yeah, yeah. And I think um, what experiences like the New York strike do for people, um, like the your teachers. For yes. Example, yeah. Is that they they give them experience of like without banding together. The producers would replace all of us, right? Right. Like, like, so they have an experience of being a union and seeing how they collectively have a lot of power. And so that's why when your teacher says, "Wait, who was subbing for you?" and they're not a member of the union, right? Like, no, that's right. not going to happen. And so right. I think that is is um, something that's sometimes missing in the education piece. Yeah. And. Um, you know, it's not that, I mean, it's just a culture, right? Like in New York City, when I was coming up. Um, it's a big culture there. I had no experience of, the, of, of Local 8 or 2. Okay. None whatsoever. All I knew is that if I wanted to sub on Broadway, that I had to join. Right. Like I learned later, but it was like, it was part of the culture. That yeah. You just, and, and again, it comes from that struggle and having that experience of winning together and knowing that like everything that we do that that isn't, up to that standard is going to undermine it. Right. right? Um, At one point, I remember Don saying early on, Don Parker's, you know, the contract's what, what binds us. You know, they could still fire us with the contract, but, like, at least while we're doing the gig, it, it, fair treatment. Um, yeah. Like, if a band member gets a mohawk, <laughs> you <laughs> the can't. The mohawk story. The, oh you can't. Such a great You story. can't tell them not to play because we have a contract that says we we can wear what we want and it's a circus yes you know and the main clown did it you know like right it's so silly and crazy but it was people in different spots of power thinking they could run the show and but our con you know other people had a clause that they had to be clean shaven mm -hmm. we did not you right. know like and it's funny because it was all there and it really showed me like it's, it's agreement like for both of us to help um protect both of us both sides but like you said People are so afraid sometimes to unionize, but they could still f fire you without fire it anyway. Right? Yeah, like they're That's like we're just trying to get better treatment, or at least keep it fair, keep it um, up to standards, you mm -hmm. know. And out here, it's 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 a it's a different mentality than New York. I'll say. Yeah, yeah and it, I'm hoping yeah. we can work together to change yeah, that a little bit so out too. here. But um, and that's one thing that. Uh, that I hear a lot from people like, oh, well, um, I'm sure that there are some issues over here, but everybody's scared. It's like, well, do you not think that the people at Amazon aren't scared right. of being fired? And they yeah. realized, you know, on Staten Island, that's a great story, uh, the Starbucks employees. I mean, yeah. every, every worker is afraid, right? So um, what we do in organizing is we, we, we have a process where we try to get people over those fears. Right. And one of the things that, that we say is like, can't they do that now? Right. Like, yeah. Um, but I wanted to, uh, the, the, the story that you referenced is one of my favorite and, <laughs> and it, I'm, I'm going to give you my take on it. So, okay. Um, All right. So I was out, I was actually in Las Vegas at a convention. We used to have our conventions at the old Riviera, which oh, is now, okay. um, blown up, blown up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a ginormous convention center extension now built there. Right. Um, and so I'm in the Riviera and I loved the carpet in the Riviera. It was some of the ugliest carpet <laughs> in the world. And when they were closing, I tried to get some of my friends out here to buy me. Oh, wow. Carpet. That's funny. Could never get my hands on it. The rib was something. Um, it, was, it, was it was really was cool, something. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm there and, and Don had called me and I was super busy because it was the convention. Yeah. And he started going on about, he started asking me specific questions about the appearance clause on the contract. And I'm like, okay, where is this coming from? <laughs> you know? And so he starts going into it a little bit and I'm just like so busy. I'm just like, well, Don, can you just do me a favor and just put it all in an email? Cause I'm, I'm just out here. It's a hundred degrees. And I, right. I, 
I can't really process all this. Right. I don't have the contract in front of me. Yeah. And so I got back to New York City and, um, you know, check my email and I get this email from Don, who was the union steward on. Yeah. The, was that the blue or the red? That was the blue. And and you were always, your name was famous because it was when everything, something was going wrong. I'm calling Manly. That was the thing. <laughs> I'm calling Manly. And then Don would be like, all right, let's hold on before we call yeah. Manly. Let me, you know, that's let's great. work this out. It was always, I'm calling Manly. So, <laughs> yeah. That's great. Uh, you know? I love that. Yeah. And before I even knew you, it was like, call it Manly. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. That's great. And uh, I, so I, you know, I, I'm like, okay, Don had something he was referencing and I get back to New York and I, I get this email and the first sentence of the email is, um, well, this whole thing started when the clowns decided to give Joel a mohawk. It was Joel. Yep. And I couldn't read anymore <laughs> because I was literally on the floor of my office laughing. Yeah. Cause I was like, this has got to be the best <laughs> email I've ever yeah. received. And I was just like, oh my God, I don't even know what, what's going on here. But we did we did do some investigating and yeah. there was some uh, some shenanigans happening with yeah. a mohawk. But yeah, again, you know, nothing happened. We had we didn't, you know, we were able to Yeah, I mean he so Joel, it was his last week, I think. Okay. And we were all buddies with the clowns and they they wanted to give him a mohawk. And like the main famous clown. This guy David Larelay actually helped do it, and they spiked it up, and he went out, and we had some curmudgeons, I'd say, in management. I mean, it was silly. Yeah, you know? yeah. There was clowns with mohawks, like, right. and they said, "Oh, you can't do that." They were thinking we had that clause in our contract, and Joel actually said, "I'll buzz it, I'll shave it, I'll do whatever you want." Yeah, but they told him he couldn't perform, mm. and so he didn't perform, but he still got paid for it because. There was nothing in there. Yeah. For and he actually, I was there. He was like, "I'll do what you want," and they just went off and it got heated and they told him to leave. And I mean, I was there for it all, and it was just silly because it didn't need to happen. It was yeah, just kind of a fun like. It's your last week. The class. It was like kind of a yeah, and it just some party poopers out there weren't. But the but the contract did didn't have a clause and. What was good, other contracts did out yeah. there with, uh, I guess, uh, the stagehands. And that's where the contract was. They have Them having one and us having one was clear. Like, oh, yeah, they have to be clean cut. There's nothing. Yeah. You know? And I don't think we were like, it's not like, we, like we're going to do it forever or whatever. It was just kind of a fun last week thing. Yeah. And he would, he, like, I remember seeing him comb it down. I'll, work, I'll do whatever you want. And they just, Oh, weren't having it. The the lo people on the local unit, mm. and I don't know if it was personal reasons or what, but it was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, um, it's a legendary story, I guess. So yeah, so don't let the clowns cut your hair. Don't let the clowns cut your hair. That's a key. If you, that's uh, if there's one piece of career advice yeah. <laughs> that we can give you. Yeah, it's don't let the clowns cut your hair. Exactly. There we go. We can end on that. <laughs> Well, um, thank you so much for sharing, yeah, sure. uh, Bill, today. Yeah, it was a blast. And, uh, you know, you're like a, an incredibly varied performer. You're a lifelong learner, and you're out there showing up and uh, using the, the Gigamatic to find out if you're getting it. That's right. Or not. So, uh, <laughs> you're going to make an app for that. I, we need an app for <laughs> you it. You need an app for it. <laughs> um, I don't have any development friends, but we're going to work on that. We'll work on that. Yeah. Or t shirt, at least. Yeah. <laughs> the um, next convention. Some swag, some Gigamatic swag. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for um, having great me. Great to have you, and we'll look forward to seeing you um, on the bandstand or uh, elsewhere in the All future. All right, sounds good, Mike. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Take care.